right? So we are we are ready, I guess. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, I hope that I am uh, I can be he heard well uh, over Zoom as well. Uh, so we have a short evening session of uh, presentations uh, on uh, learning and development. Uh, my name is Lauri Linask, who uh, don't know me. Uh, I am a lecturer of cultural theory at, uh, at Tallinn University, and I am a, a PhD student uh, forever at the uh, University of uh, Tartu. So my background is in, in semiotics, but uh, I'm uh, more actively working on, on cultural theory. So I'm going to be chair uh, this evening, and I'm also the one to begin with a presentation. So, uh, because I already know that um, I run the risk of uh, going, going over time, I would like uh, you to help me to keep track of the time and uh, at the same time be patient at it. So we have some, uh, some time this evening, but uh, let's, uh, let's hope that everything will work out well. Um, so I trust that uh, uh, that uh, we'll just uh, cooperate on these things. <clears throat> Uh, so, um, just to begin, my presentation uh, was titled in the abstract, The Symbolic Forms of Perception in Lev Vygotsky's uh, Approach, but when uh, focusing on these issues and the writings, I saw that uh, most of the papers that I referred to this evening were also authored by Alexander Luria, and I will uh, perhaps, if I have an extra time, I'll mention why this Luria's uh, name is so important here. Most of this is relies on on uh, neural processes, and uh, Luria was ne the neurologist in this uh, Vygotsky Luria team. So, uh, so that's why perhaps his name is uh, as important as Vygotsky's. But to begin, I wanted to show a short clip. I hope that it will work. Hannah is ein Jahr und sieben Monate alt. Der Stein hat positive Valenz im augenblicklichen Lebensraum des Kindes. Das Kind wird vom Stein angezogen, um sich hinzusetzen muss sich das Kind jedoch umdrehen, also vom Ziel abwenden. Dieser Umweg zum Ziel fällt Kindern besonders schwer. Uh, so, um, what uh, was in this video um, was uh, little Hanna trying to sit on the stone. So Hanna is one year and seven months old. And you see that while Hanna is making the circles around the stone, she really can't turn herself around to sit on it, but has to maintain this eye contact with the, with the stone. This very uh, famous video, perhaps somebody, some of you have seen it before. So this uh, uh, video was made by Kurt Levin, um, and uh, the video was analyzed by Vygotsky, when Vygotsky analyzed perceptual uh, fields, which basically is something that I want to talk about uh, today. Kurt Levin is an interesting name because he was kind of a contact between Vygotsky and then William Stern in Hamburg. William Stern was kind of a forefather for ecological uh, psychology that later developed in the States by uh, Gibson. But uh, at the same time, when Stern was working in Hamburg, um, at the same time, Jakob von Uxkel was also in Hamburg. So he is kind of a weak link or weak connection between, between the two thoughts. And uh, so uh, the general uh, uh, vibe of, uh, of what I want to talk uh, is uh, exactly uh, the historical context of these uh, thoughts between Vygotsky and Uxkel. So I would like to start uh, with uh, another name altogether. It's Ernst Kassirer from the same era. So uh, uh, Kassirer was a ma quite major figure in the, in the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, he was known by his uh, uh, philosophy of the symbolic form. So language, myth, art, religion, and he tried to know what ties them as one. So what's the characteristic of human forms of uh, of activity from a cognitive point of view. So biologically, humans function in the environment like other animals, except for the symbol system. So uh, hu humans are the symbolic animals, it calls it. So it's kind of a direct line um, of thought against the, with this, the symbolic species idea. That's quite common in, in the semiotics today. So he realizes that the differences between species must ultimately lie in meaning making. And he tries to compare meaning making in humans and other species, so from an evolutionary point of view. He tries to use Kohler and Yerkes observation of chimpanzees. These are two 
uh, main authors at the time on this topic. And he uh, tries to draw this comparison between species by comparing them in terms of Jakob von Uxkul's Umwelt concept and the concept of a functional cycle. Uh, more importantly, for this discussion, he tries to draw human-specific symbolic meaning making from the psychological functions which we share with other animals, such as perception, practical problem solving, memory, and so on. So how symbolic meaning making in humans affairs in relation to these functions is something that should become apparent in the observation of ontogeny. And ontogeny is what I'm interested in here. So he studies uh, the cases of these deaf and blind uh, children, Helen Keller and Laura Bridgman, uh, uh, they, the, the this deaf and blind girls discover at a certain point of the development that everything has a name, that it, uh, which is a universal principle of meaning making in humans. But uh, uh, the important is that they discover this sign relationship at a certain point of the development. Uh, so Helen Geller and Laura Bridgman are also interesting names, and especially the cases because. Uh, <clears throat> They've been this, uh, these cases have been discussed until very recent literature, in, for example, in Merlin Donald, who also uses exactly their case to make um, his point uh, uh, on, on those developmental matters. Now, uh, uh, Uppskull uh, is re represented in Kassira in, in quite uh, particular ways. Uh, Kassira ambitiously tried to explain the parents of what he called the symbolic forms in human thinking in terms of Uxkull's uh, uh, concept of a functional uh, cycle. He describes Uxkull's model, the receptor system and defector system. He says that the symbol system adds a new dimension to reality, which is a characteristic of human umbel. We just do not have perception in the symbol system, but perception and symbol system become integrated with each other. So while hu human meaning making must be characterized in terms of the functional cycle like other species, how to describe it in terms of this cycle is the question. Um, while the elementary psychological functioning of various species is so similar, is this cycle somehow different in humans, therefore creating the vast differences in the behaviors? So Kassira uh, draws a, a variety of comparisons uh, uh, between uh, 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 species which he sets in the background of Umwelt and of most apes, and on the other hand, humans, insight versus rationality, signs versus symbols, direct thought tied to perceptual present versus reflection, um, awareness of signs, uh, uh, practical problem solving uh, in all species uh, uh, versus abstraction and imagination in people, uh, which is all in all then in the sphere of cognition. Then he compares emotional speech uh, of chimpanzee or emotional communication versus propositional speech in humans, declarative speech and syntactical dif uh, differentiation all as in humans versus this uh, sharp distinction between other species that he describes. Uh, it all can be then vastly characterized in this nature culture distinction. And in fact, in re recent literature, this have simply been called the three C's in the sense that uh, 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 in, in how to observe those attitudes towards the in uh, comparison of humans versus other species. So Kassira claims that the symbolic thought cannot be drawn from the senses altogether. Uh, it cannot be drawn from the sensory motor world, uh, which is shared then by many species. So he says that how much you would teach a chimpanzee, a uh, chimpanzee will never come close to being able to acquire symbolic thought. He claims that the form of the sign itself is the source of symbolic thought. And this form is something that only humans can derive the thought from, uh, as this deprivation of the senses does not deny symbolic thought in the cases of, of uh, Helen Keller and Laura Bridgman. The symbols are characterized by the form and as they are functional in nature rather than material, he assumes that the development cannot have material basis. So um, uh, after discussing uh, the central challenges uh, uh, of uh, this task to uh, explain then this psychological uh, functioning of humans in terms of, of Jakob von Uxkel's uh, Umwelt concept, uh, I uh, find then a similar attempt in the writings of Vygotsky and Luria, uh, which, who do not know uh, Uxkel's work. But uh, uh, as I uh, will try to demonstrate then, uh, Vygotsky and Luria uh, 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 exactly try to uh, catch this uh, symbolic thought in, in terms of those <clears throat> sensory motor functions. 
So the problem with Hasira's thinking uh, on this topic is that even if humans were to draw the use of symbols as a spontaneous discovery, then from what source this discovery arises? Like, why would it come about in humans? And how would symbols then be integrated within human behavior and human cognition if they are like two distinct uh, spheres? So this is my central question here. So Hasira approach uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, discussing these matters in terms of Uxkul's functional cycle is an effort, but a failed effort uh, to describe human umwelt then in terms of this uh, cycle. It looks like for Kassir, the concept of umwelt is general enough to help us describe meaning making as it is similar to all species, but too general to describe uh, meaning making in humans. So I want to have a very quick uh, comment uh, on uh, uh, another work from the same era. So uh, Marta Muchau's um, uh, study uh, is also an explicit effort to ground human development on Uxkul's model. So in the early 1930s, as a junior member at the Institute, Muchau conducted a series of observations of what she calls the life space of the urban child. So her goal was to characterize what Muhau calls children's life worlds, that is the subjective environment in which the children naturally live in. Uh, like uh, Uxkul with his own specific e examples, she related environmental characteristics to behavior of children of different ages and spe specifically contrasted uh, children's perceived environment to the physical environment. Uh, she also then described the children's life worlds on the basis of how they differ from those of grown-ups. Uh, she uses um, Uxkul's Umwelt und Innenwelt der Tiere and uh, a Stern, Stern's book, um, which uh, uses the term life world. But uh, this Muho's notion of life world is very broadly equivalent to Uxkul's, uh, Uxkul's Umwelt. Uh, it must be noted that in, while this study is really beautiful in various ways, uh, I wish I could go into it in more detail, perhaps if by some luck we have more time, she was rather more focused on the methodologies of field work, so how to apply it. Uh, and um, he didn't uh, really uh, ground her work much in philosophical terms. So uh, Uxkul's ideas in this were only um, uh, uh, applied in very broad uh, strokes. Uh, so it is more this behavioral uh, uh, attempt or uh, attempt to apply the concept of umwelt from a behavioral point of view as an observational met methodology rather than a philosophical approach. So another uh, uh, point of terminology that I, I want to uh, uh, approach before I get to Vygotsky and uh, Luria. So uh, uh, there is a methodolog methodological issue and a terminological issue to be solved when, um, when uh, analyzing sensory motor processes uh, in terms of Uxkull's uh, uh, umwelt or the fi uh, functional cycle. So part of my inspiration here is, uh, uh, is from Dua on Uxkull's interpretation of Piaget's developmental theory. So I don't want to go into detail here again because of lack of time, but uh, Tura on Uxkul demonstrates that Piaget's approach, which also in its parts is explicitly semiotic, is very well compatible with our uh, Umbat theory. Uh, uh, Tura on Uxkul says Piaget's approach is application of, of uh, Uxkul's central ideas to human development in brief, while again, Piaget himself was not aware of Uxkul's work. So, uh, this uh, Tura on Uxkul's article is uh, valuable because it explicitly explains the concept of sensory motor processes in terms of the uh, functional cycle and umwelt. So for Piaget, reality, the world for the young child is constituted by the sensory motor connection that ties the child to that reality. Reality for chil uh, children is not the same as it is for grown-ups or for the observer for that matter. Meaning is the particular relationship between the child and the child's reality uh, for the child. Since every stimulus, uh, for example, a perception within the sensory part of the sensory motor system presupposes a readiness to act in the motor part, the readiness therefore selects as a stimulus a phenomenon of the environment which had been neutral up to that point. As the stimulus must realize the reaction, 
However, the reflex can only be described as a circular event in which a neutral phenomenon receives a property which it does not have independently from the reacting organ and which loses it again after the completion of that reflex. So from that point of view, the perception is no more a direct connection between the sensory apparatus and an external phenomenon. It is the organism's readiness to react to a phenomenon. Without the readiness to act, there can be no stimulus. And with a cessation of the readiness to react, the stimulus ceases to be a stimulus. So every stimulus which happens in the receptor system is really already part of the cognitive system. And perceptual systems as such are cognitive in nature. So both stimulus and sign in Nuxkul's terminology have a material carrier capable of physical or chemical description, as well as a meaning which is to an extent independent of that carrier. It is something different other than the carrier as it is. And the meaning is attributed to the stimulus through the readiness of the organ to react, and it is attributed to the sign by the sign user. Uh, so the relationship between stimulus and reaction is a relationship between parts or elements as a whole. So it is a system that works uh, together. Uh, so uh, stimuli are not uh, flying around somewhere out there uh, waiting for us to catch them, but the organisms um, uh, attribute uh, some physical or chemical pro uh, properties within its perce perceptual system as something. So for Piaget, as well as Uxkul, reality for the child is constituted in the child's meaningful relationship with it. The sensory motor system can be taken as the functional cycle in which receptor systems are tied with effector systems. In the beginning, the sensory motor system consists of circular reflex reflexes or reactions later conditioned if separate circular reflexes are coordinated with each other. So different functional cycles are integrated in brief. In this way, both perceptual and action sch schema are formed in the organism's rel relationship with the environment. Uh, a conditioned relationship, itself a circular response, is a creation of learning, already an abstraction as attribution of meaning to early circular responses. Uh, the secondary sensory motor uh, systems are structurally built upon the primary systems. So uh, the next question then is uh, the question of language and the symbolic system as parts of the functional cycle or different functional cycles constituting what is uh, human umwelt. Words as signs that reorganize the psychological functioning. So Vygotsky's approach relates the use of cultural science systems developed in historic time, like language, writing, gestures, drawing, and so on, to different psychological functions, such as perception, attention, memory, practical problem solving, and tool use, which develop in the, in the individual person. Vygotsky offers an integrated cognitive theory of science. It is a developmental account of the acquisition and use of these science systems, and at the same time, an account of the changes that take place in these psychological functions. Vygotsky and Luria show how perception, memory, attention, and movement are internally connected and reorganized during the development of sign use activity of the child. So uh, the paper at hand focuses on these changes, uh, uh, especially in the functioning of perception, which then accompany the acquisition of sign symbol use or something that symbol use brings along in, in perception. But uh, uh, when analyzing perception, then other psychological functions have to be taken account as uh, it is shown that this, these changes in perception are the results of coordination of different uh, psychological functions altogether. So uh, Vygotsky's and Luria's idea also common to those times was that every elementary form of behavior includes a response reaction to a stimulus, a situation uh, or the task that the organism has at hand is a stimulus for a memorized behavior. And the reaction, the established response, uh, the relationship between the two, an associative or a conditional reflexive condition, connection. So you see this connection or this model um, of, uh, of a sign on, on this uh, slide. So it is a connection between S and R. And what is introduced here is this auxiliary, auxiliary aid X. So a sign operation brings into this elementary behavior between S and R an intermediate link, which can be a word, but in principle, any other kind of sign as well. So uh, drawings, for example, is something that uh, Vygotsky especially analyzed in these terms. Uh, 
So the sci in itself, when introduced into this uh, uh, model, goes through a development, this differentiation with speech, for example, or differentiation in children's drawing. Instead of one, two other connections are established that lead to the same result, but in different ways. The, so the stimulus is S, the result is R, or response is R, and um, two connections are established then uh, that would leave from S to R instead of this one direct uh, link. So each of the connections take, taken separately is the same condition reflex uh, uh, or conditioned response process of closure in the cerebral cortex as the direct associative connection. New in this model is the fact that one connection is replaced by two others. New is the construction or combination of nerve connections. So new or learned is the direction of the specific process of closure of the connection with a sign. So direction is important here as well because the direction um, won't stay uh, uh, one in, as a result, but uh, the direction can vary uh, as a result of this auxiliary connection. The lower form, the direct link between S and R is the basis and content of this uh, form. Uh, and the uh, higher form, that includes the auxiliary mean uh, only appears at a certain stage of development and it uh, in turn itself continuously passes into the lower form because this S to X and X to R are all uh, conditioned reflex processes basically. So in essence, taking place in sensor, sensory motor systems. So uh, when uh, S is mediated by X to R, a stimulus response cycle is uh, as a result uh, concluded or a sensory motor uh, uh, process is finalized. So this uh, secondary stimulus is actively included in the operation where it begins to fulfill as means for serving its organization. So this auxiliary mean, for example, uh, speech uh, creates a new relationship between uh, S and R. Uh, uh, the direct impulse between S and R in, is inhibited and the operation is acted uh, indirectly. Uh, right, so uh, this in brief is the, is the uh, model of, that uh, Luria and Vygotsky uh, introduced to explain uh, uh, this um, uh, sensory motor uh, processes in terms of inclusion of uh, words within it. So uh, the idea is um, that uh, uh, while S and R for, um, is uh, 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 in the sensory motor sphere, uh, the X itself, uh, uh, whatever sign it is, changes those sensory motor uh, uh, cycles in terms of how X is built. So different kinds of X, be it in speech or drawing, would change those sensory motor processes depending on the way uh, this X is uh, built. Right. So uh, I have to uh, skip some of the uh, uh, specific aspects in this model and uh, then uh, try to go straight uh, to, uh, to how, uh, to what kind of ways this X may uh, uh, change then those sensory motor cycles. So, uh, uh, so this X uh, changes uh, the uh, perception in relation to other functions. Uh, in fact, uh, because this X is always a product of culture or the social cultural environment of the child's activities, um, it is uh, in essence the cultural organization of uh, psychological function. So I will focus on perception. Language acquisition and symbol use more broadly brings great qualitative changes to cognitive processes, but it is not so much individual psychological functions that change, but the organization in relation to each other. So already in its natural forms, uh, it is not so much functions separately, which are important, but how they work together and how the relationships change in the complex whole. So the interaction between perception and speech includes several different psychological functions at the same time. Again, uh, Rogotsky and Luria describe it uh, based on girl, uh, basically like Cassia did. So the main difference between humans and chimpanzees lie in the use of symbols on this auxiliary X. In the perceptual field, elements are perceived all at the same time, 
uh, thus in its composition, it, the field as it is, is integral or total compared to speech, which demands indication of elements, ordering and joining elements together into a sentence structure, and uh, it, which is thereby analytic. So in the beginning, during the child development, perception is integral, differentiating only in time. So the early speech of the child functions externally within the situation together with the object and the activities of the child. So X as a kind of a sensory motor uh, a relationship with the environment actually is indistinct within the environment, such as uh, um, uh, perception as a whole. So we hear all sorts of sounds and uh, voices uh, from outside of the world. So uh, speech in the beginning is just among uh, other of those functions. So uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, the, in order to deal uh, with any kind of object, uh, the small child needs a whole set of additional bodily movements to compensate the lack of verbal development. So uh, whatever kind of response the child uh, has, um, it is uh, the, even if it is uh, vocal, it is uh, just part of other responses that the child uh, would have towards the environment. Uh, so according to uh, Vygotsky, the function of, of early words and movements within the situation as a perceptual whole is indication. So part of the vocal aspects starts to have a, a indicating function within that environment. Uh, in perception, indication with the help of science enables the child to single out and distinguish concrete single objects within the situation as a whole. So naming the toy enables the child to focus the situation for the parents. Using words, adults guide the attention of the child at some objects and not others. Uh, words become centers of the perceptual structure for the child. So adoption of words organizes the natural structure of the situation around the meanings. So from that point on, perception is no longer an observation of some shape or color. It is not isolated, but categorized. So in a way, humans perceive with the aid of speech. Uh, with the help of symbols, the child infers from the environment without having to resort only to his or her senses. After the acquisition of speech, operations of a child are characterized by a, a greater freedom of behavior from that immediate present of the visual situation of the application of these operations. So the child learns to prepare the solution of a problem uh, beforehand in speech as a field, and only then realize it in the motor activity. Young children manipulate objects in the given field of vision, whereas the child's symbolic operations become detached from this natural field of vision, and they become uh, 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 modeled uh, in the field of speech. So with aid of speech, the child creates auxiliary stimuli standing between the child and the environment, acquiring the re relative freedom from the situation at hand. Impulsive behavior is thus transformed into a planned, organized behavior. So engaged in various activities, the child no longer has to follow the visual connection between the activity and its goal. Uh, uh, in the situation at hand, uh, and an activity may acquire a purpose or goal that is not visible in the concrete present of that activity. So the child may include aids in direct methods or means which brings along new additional stimuli that are not present in the immediate perceptual field. Uh, right. So I know that I uh, lack uh, time badly. So uh, I, uh, I uh, will be really brief in trying to, uh, to bring this uh, uh, thesis together. So in the beginning, in a very young child, speech is undifferentiated within the functional cycle or the sensor, uh, sensory motor sphere. Uh, then it splits as expression develops as a communicative means as one sensory motor system and various psychological function, uh, functions develop as other uh, sensory motor systems. So the functional cycle might refer uh, might more refer to modeling of the umwelt as a whole rather than its parts. But in principle, then, uh, uh, this, the functional cycle of the organism consists of, of uh, well, at least two sensory motor systems that are related to each other, the perceptual system and speech. 
then the two sensory motor system, the system of elementary psychological functions in the speech are coordinated again. The speech comes to coordinate the perception and the senses, um, as well as then the motor activity of the child uh, when the child is active in the environment. So in that sense, then speech reorganizes the sensory motor system, uh, including um, perception and uh, other psychological functions that are related to perception next to it. So uh, I was uh, terribly short of time and uh, I understand. And uh, so I, I uh, had to be really brief in some of the aspects here, but uh, I hope that you got the general picture of uh, how Vygotsky saw this intermediate link between perception and the symbol system. But uh, just a quick add to go back to this uh, little Hanna situation there. So Hanna is facing a particular problem of coordinating the perceptual field and the motor field. And uh, the same kind of coordination problem um, is uh, in, in essence what Vygotsky sees between language and then those uh, psychological functions like perception. So it's a problem of coordination of senses. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking too much time with it, but uh, perhaps uh, if there are some brief questions, they are still possible. Yeah? Okay, uh, thanks. So uh, Luke maybe knows, do we have time for questions or? Uh, we still, we have to time uh -huh. Okay, so then just in case we should move on if there are not very, any very brief questions. Uh, just one brief one else. I was just wondering, uh, I don't myself wondering, whether Vygotsky was uh, I think maybe not uh, thinking about it, but I wonder about uh, how accessible this jewelry uh, uh, finds are in the way that so we have some But uh, so uh, if uh, if Bogotsky is uh, right, then uh, we should find evidence for these kinds of uh, things in all sorts of uh, faculties of symbolic behavior. So one of his own examples was came from drawing. So uh, when uh, when there is a very small child, let's say a two year old, and the child catches a pencil or something, and then starts scribbling on a paper or or drawing, right? So the scribbling is like part of one field, a uh, perceptual field, but then this child activities in the environment can be considered like another field, whatever the child uh, uh, has surrounding him, a cup or something, for example. So uh, this integration of the systems uh, of drawing and what is being drawn is something that happens in the development. And I guess uh, uh, a drawing can be taken as something that uh, where the same kind of process of coordinating uh, between expression and, uh, and the perceptual field can be found. So I think that in, at least in principle, there are many systems in which we can observe these things. So, so the question is still uh, in many ways historical one because uh, I mean there are so many uh, types of evidence that is missing from this argument, right? So, uh, but okay, thanks for for your time and thanks for the question. Uh, I guess it is uh, high time to uh, move on. So I will stop uh, sharing this. And uh, we already have Annette Persson uh, ready. So if you want to uh, uh, share your presentation, do you have something to share? 
So we have Annette Persson and Sarah Leninger. Uh, Annette Persson is a, a lecturer on art and aesthetics at the Department of Education at Kristianstad uh, University. And Sarah Leninger is a senior lecturer and the head of aesthetics at the Department of Education at Kristianstad University and also associate professor of cognitive semiotics at, uh, at Lund. And Sarah Leninger, of course, is also uh, uh, part of the board of, uh, of NAS and, uh, and actually the treasurer of uh, NAS. Uh, so uh, welcome. It's teenagers engagement with pictures and artistic texts, semiotics in students' picture elicited conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your presentation and your introduction to um, this, um, this presentation that we're intending to carry on with. Um, so <laughs> Uh, we're speaking to you from uh, Malmö, Sweden, and I hope the sound is okay or that there's no, um, yeah, there's just no problems with that in that case, let us know. Uh, of course, we wish that we were uh, in Vilnius right now, but uh, we'll see you the next time. Uh, so, yeah, this is, um, this presentation is, uh, is, a, is a development from uh, my former master's thesis um, that is on students' picture conversations or teenagers' engagement with pictures and artistic text. And uh, it is the starting point of a project within educational science and semiotics, um, and especially se semiotics of pictures going forward. So we find ourselves in within semiotics, um, art and education. The, so the context is specifically education, art subject, art teachers, and semiotics of pictures. Uh, and here from this study that we're uh, taking some examples are, uh, is it art in Swedish primary school or Swedish elementary school? And in Swedish elementary school, school art as a subject is a man mandatory subject um, and that is generally focused on communication. Um, and the presentation is also taking um, a point from teenagers pictures and picture conversations. So on the heels of increased digital communication, the need for knowledge development of how visual communication is consumed has been deemed an essential part of education. And it's our conviction uh, that this knowledge can be refined and expanded by engaging with and creating pictures and artistic texts. Uh, so there are two underlying assumptions in um, um, philosopher in education, Paolo Freire, um, his ideas on education for critical consciousness. And these standpoints are that there is um, an aesthetic dimension to emancipation and that there is a relationship between words and images uh, and between the verbal and the visual. Um, so we see didactic challenges between pursuing opportunities of open-minded exploration in the classroom, while also having a call for a more systematic analysis, uh, which for instance could be found in refined reflection. Okay, I should uh, just start first to establish some theoretical grounds. And uh, well, according to Lotman, a text is an invariant system of relations with its demarcations and uh, the defining structures. Uh, but the text is also the manifestation of these structures in variant forms. Uh, in the structure of artistic text from 77, uh, Lotman explains art and artistic, artistic text as bound to social processes and artistic activity. Uh, Lotman acknowledged that art is not the clearest form of communication perhaps, but it's, polysemic, it's polysystemic, uh, it's experimental, uh, and uh, it contains considerably more information than non-artistic text. Uh, in artistic text, the text itself uh, and its language 
becomes the carrier of the meaning. It's a kind of um, Jacobson perspective there. And uh, we have, uh, and he sums, uh, the summarized the artistic text that it can be realized as uh, a kind of deliberate deliberate design, the author and all the artist uh, of the text can choose the language and choose among different possibilities in language, uh, which uh, the author creates. <laughs> it's uh, the artistic text is dense and complex. The text belongs to two or several languages simultaneously. Uh, not only do the elements of the text take on dual or multiple meaning, but uh, the entire structure uh, becomes carrier of information. Uh, so, and it's within the text and then it's ex without, from outside of the text. And uh, he and we some his third point as a kind of cognitive action that the artistic text violates, and that's a kind of rhetorics. It violates structures and norms, and sometimes to create a tension in the text, and other times to leave some parts to be unfinished for the readers to complete. That is a part that is important for us here in this this project. And he has this third uh, point that uh, the text is a social function, uh, the cultural mechanism, material culture and the ideology affect what texts are, are read uh, in different social, social circumstances or epochs, some genres perhaps, and which use of the text that calls for new interpretations. Um, okay, uh, and it, see, it seems for us then reasonable to assign that the status uh, to the domain of pictorial meaning is that it uh, reduces uh, to neither phenomenology nor to the ontology of aesthetics experiences, but includes both of them and also uh, needs or is part of a semiotic system of pictures. So in this sense, the, um, in this study, three conceptual pairs were each uh, on different ways uh, focuses on um, uh, or different areas of the semiotic analysis can be focused. Uh, and uh, we divide these three conceptual pairs that we, uh, we have um, found it covers uh, uh, the semiotics of the picture in different levels. So the first semiotic pair is, or conceptual pair, is the pair that defines the, the sign uh, in the structuralistic uh, context. So it's the differentiation between the expression and content, or it's a, the entities that contracts, that to, together contracts the sign function. And the concept to identify the, it's a concept to identify the dual facet in the sign relation, constituting the commutal, commutal and asymmetric character of the sign. Um, you, and this other layer is not on the full sign, and does not is a, a layer within the sign, you could say, uh, and it's the la it's the differentiation between denotation and connotation, and we know there is a lot of different interpretation of this dual term, but uh, we think it's possible for us in this to to go between the different. Um, uh, per interpretation of the terms, because uh, in one way it's describing the relationship between what is perceived or labeled in a sense, according to Goodman at least, uh, in a picture and what meaning can be added to what we perceive. Uh, I thought uh, when uh, Juan felt talk about um, the propositions today, perhaps that could be a sense of denotation also. Um, so, what uh, this uh, is one of the layers that we are looking at, uh, and the other layer is the layer that belongs specifically to, to pictorial science or visual science, according to Jean-Marie Floch and Rukmi, and that is the distinction between the plastic and the pictorial organizations of levels uh, on the pictorial surface and in the picture as uh, um, an iconic sign. I think that is enough for 
projects. And uh, it, summarizing these um, conceptual pairs, and uh, or at least we can say that one of the presumptions here is that given that the conceptual pairs are valid, they will have impact on meaning making with pictures. Uh, moreover, in expecting a continuum um, of semiotic systems, as according to Lotman, the conceptual pairs should also come up in the conversations about pictures. Um, and this, we think, should be true at different levels, uh, whether the participants in the conversations are trained in reflecting on these specific perceptual or conceptual paths uh, or not. Uh, the PRISM model uh, was designed uh, in this project to pursue or to display uh, the conceptual paths in pictures conversations. Uh, it's an, anal an analytical tool, so, uh, and uh, the model does not contain um, any exclusive categories, so, nor does it aim to be all encompassing for all interactions that occurred during the picture conversations. Uh, each side of this uh, prism correlates to one conceptual pair. The triangle base, the yellow area in the middle here, uh, is um, uh, what we is the side that keeps together the concept of inter the, the, the three other concepts, and it is the concept of intersubjectivity, which uh, in this is to be understood as all of what is shared in the conversations in this sense, or they are all, it deals with all that is shared in the conversation, I should say. Um, okay. And now more specifically over to the, to the study. So the aim of the study was to uh, contribute uh, knowledge of how teenagers engage with visual text specifically, and out of that uh, specifically the engagement with potential artistic text um, and the definition of Lotman's, and identifying types of semiotic layers, dimensions, and levels uh, that teenagers engage with when they are interacting with pictures. Um, the study involved two disciplines, uh, semiotics, of course, the study of meaning making and um, aesthetic learning as general didactics within the field of uh, educational science. Um, so the, in the study, the participating students attended Swedish uh, elementary schools, so a grade eight for us, which would be about 14 to 15 years old. And we had three groups with three students in each group. Uh, and the students were asked in advance to bring a picture uh, that they had created or chosen themselves in some way. And these pictures were treated as artistic text through the engagement and open, uh, through the engagement within the, the study and were open for intersubject reflections um, on their own terms. It was a student driven conversation. Um, so depending on the picture and the group constellation, different aspects of the picture were focused on uh, for different amounts of time. And in the analysis, uh, through the use of the PRISMA model that you just saw, uh, categories of uh, what was most prominent uh, in the conversations were derived. So the participants uh, generally showed a very agile movement between different understandings of and engagement with pictures. So the conversations moved, uh, for instance, between uh, different con uh, conceptions of pictures, including uh, pictures expression and content, uh, plastic and pictorial organization, and uh, den denotative and connotative dimensions. In all conversations, there was a focus on uh, aesthetic experience in some way or uh, judgment, aesthetic judgment. And this was prominent uh, as well as them speaking of pictures as being uh, a representation of such uh, of the lived world. Uh, so here are some pictures uh, from the study um, where, and it was a, a specific order of doing things. So first uh, each participant uh, showed their picture, put their picture at the middle of the table. And then uh, they were not allowed to say anything about their picture uh, because uh, the group uh, were asked to speak about the picture first. Uh, so they did that for a while, and then the person who had brought the picture was allowed to join the discussion. So that was the first uh, kind of step. 
Um, and after all participants were discussed, the students were asked if they wanted to make any changes in their pictures. So um, we were using iPads and drawing on in an iPad uh, drawing app. Uh, so they edited uh, drawings um, or their pictures if they wanted to, and then they presented their pictures again. These um, com picture conversations were recorded and um, uh, citations uh, from each picture conversation was then placed into the Prisma model. And here's an example of that. And it's um, in Swedish, so <laughs> um, maybe it's confusing to read. Um, and the placement of the citations uh, is the researcher's first step in the analysis process. So this is how the, the Prisma model was used as such as a one, one step of the analysis um, uh, process. And uh, here's um, the next image here is a visual, but they were th these separate, um, um, these separate uh, models were used as, as visual diagrams as such. Uh, and this, this is like analysis in action or so. Um, and through the use of this, um, through the analysis work, uh, I could see that there was uh, different segments. Um, uh, these se different segments were, were specifically taken out of um, um, as, as being separate. And they, they were more rich than the PRISMA model itself. Um, categories uh, mostly came from the conceptual pairs um, that Sarah just presented. Um, and the, the result of using the PRISMA model uh, gives more results than the size of the model actually um, evoked. So here is, um, for instance, there was a focus on sign relation in, in many, many of the conversations, um, uh, specifically a sign relation where they sp spoke of, uh, if I change this or if this was different, uh, this would happen. Um, the teenagers uh, also spoke of uh, the picture as, um, as the lived world or re relating to something physical in the, the picture object, but uh, talking about it as the, the lived world. Um, they also spoke of pictures as pictures, and they spoke of this like in between space of speaking as pictures as pictures, but also relating the pictures to the to a, a relationship to the world. And then there was clear um, converse, conversations uh, about um, pictorial dimension or pictorial level, specifically in, in pictures that were maybe uh, could could be seen from the students as being more abstract, uh, or there was a couple of drawings that they also spoke a lot about the pictorial. Um, levels, pictorial levels, sorry. Uh, the plastic dimensions, uh, certain details specifically uh, from a plastic dimension um, for textures and shapes uh, or like specific objects or motifs. Um, added meaning was a large ca category here, a large set segment, and that was specifically or often specified if that was uh, speaking of identity or something like that, uh, different elements of added meaning. Um, as well as clear in indications or pointing out something specific like the, this is a picture of a horse, this is a lamp or whatever uh, in, in that uh, line of speaking. And then there was an interesting part where there was uh, abstraction of the concrete um, where the teenager spoke of something that seemingly was could be seemingly, seemingly concrete in the picture that was spoken of as, as quite abstract. Um, and the two categories that were, you could see in all, in all the conversations were aesthetic experience and aesthetic judgment to, to uh, different extents. Uh, and the, these were speaking of uh, something light, like uh, how a picture made them feel, uh, to uh, how uh, something in the picture was in relationship to their body. So for instance, uh, a picture of a horse and they were saying, oh, the horse is standing uh, further up from me or something like that. So these were the semiotic segments that came from the conversations and such. Um, and here's some examples of uh, using then a visual method of analysis and using these picture groups um, or picture grids. These are two pictures or two pictures that were spoken of. Um, and yeah, you could see different themes of narr narrative and uh, place and space and so on. Um, so um, one thing that was uh, interesting and, and um, very apparent was that uh, um, 
the, not all segments came up in each picture. Like mo most of the time in the, within the conversation, but not uh, couldn't say that each picture uh, uh, evoked um, uh, all the segments. Um, um, so, so, examples of that. And one major focus then with the, uh, was the picture itself, of course, and the engagement with, with the picture within each group uh, moved with some fluidity in and out and between the different pictorial um, semiotic concepts. And depending on the picture, the focus was, uh, the reflection varied. So it was due to the technical mode of production or the students' perceptions of the, the motifs of the, of the picture. Uh, what's focused on is often something else than what is the what the picture seemingly clearly depicts. So, for instance, a close-up of a horse you can see in this slide would be spoken of as um, a dear family memory or something specific about uh, how to uh, how to take care of horses. Um, and also, you have a drawing here of a girl sitting, and this was became a conversation about reflections on emotional health. And some pictures that seem concrete, for instance, uh, a, a picture of a flower will be reflected on as, as quite abstract. And, and in this example up here to, 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 the, to the top, you can see the first uh, picture is the, is the flower that was brought to the conversation. And then how this uh, student changed the picture of a flower to something that was about uh, space and time and some very abstract concepts. Um, and then in relation to uh, artistic text, the act of choosing a, a picture to bring to a situation seemed to have added to the engagement, uh, both with showing their own pictures and, and but also in how they engaged with other um, people's uh, choice of pictures. Uh, this engagement was shown both in how the students talked about uh, their pictures and how they later then manipulated their own pictures. The type of questions as well that, that they had to each other depended on the picture. So it was often focused on either the organization of the picture, the motif, uh, or what the picture viewer experienced when they looked at. So this aesthetic uh, judgment or aesthetic experience. Uh, the conversation and the context uh, created a space where the pictures were interpreted in different ways and in, in, a, in, a, in a sense were made unfinished. Um, and this engagement with any one particular could move quickly between seemingly different aspects uh, or perspectives of picture, pictures, such as speaking of the picture as a picture thing, um, as a representation of the world, uh, or as part of subjective identific uh, identifications, narratives, or interpretations. Okay, so uh, this um, quite simple game, picture game or picture conversations turn out to show very rich, uh, uh, rich uh, conversations from point of view of the se semiotic uh, co concepts or the, the, con the semiotic layers in pictures and in talking about pictures we thought and uh, bringing back the, the um, pedagogical perspective here, we just wanted to say that, well, pictures are not necessarily uh, artwork proper in this, in this sense, but they are, they were designed, uh, they are designed objects and they were chosen objects in this, in this, uh, in this conversations, and they are open for aesthetic experiences. And uh, following Per Bungard, we also think that the aesthetic experience uh, should not be understood as uh, stood and explained with reference to certain properties of an object and therefore does not require a specific competence for capturing those properties, both perceptual and intellectual. It is not the privilege of a particular app to train sections of the population. The aesthetic subject is a general subject, I think. Although during these conversation and in, in the pedagogical or the didactical uh, perspective, the teacher and the, the some of the uh, students may help each other to advance in their uh, discussions bit by bit. So it can take. 
And uh, finally, we just suggest uh, that uh, this kind of Prisma model uh, could be taken into the classroom as a, this is a suggestion that we are willing to discuss with you because if we take this uh, model or this idea about the Prisma model as a, and look at it as a triangulation in the classroom uh, then where you have the first person, you have the, the person talking about the picture and you have the second person, the one you talk with that sometimes is you, sometimes is us, and you uh, triangulate it or through, the, or through the concepts as a third person perspective. And then you have a kind of result or something coming out from it that in its turn develops your own view on the concepts and on the picture. So it could be a kind of triangulation circulation with this model that is actually our uh, didactic uh, pro proposal here in this project. Okay, I would just uh, uh, finish the talk with saying that aesthetic experience in education and uh, aesthetic text in the classroom as a basis for a general didactics but could be that it is inclusive. It doesn't, you can start from where you are, it's within you, <laughs> is it within you and the text? So in this sense, the text, perhaps the picture, uh, and you could, uh, it's inclusive in that sense. Uh, it invites for critical thinking, that it coordinates attention to an open-ended artifact in the classroom. It elicits abstract conversations and thinking, but at the same time, it can enable the refinement of the expression side, so to speak, the concrete, the picture, the plastic organization, or, or, or the, the concrete elements of the, of the picture. And it provides a familiarization and engagement in the picture making process in start. Yes, this was um, our presentation and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Thank you, Annette. Uh, so are there any questions? Uh, the, yeah, Alex? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear me well. It's not a question. Yeah, you can come closer. So yeah, so it's maybe not a question, but rather uh, I would like to specify you were speaking uh, when you're collecting this, this um, uh, phrases uh, from the children, right? What they speak about, about the picture. I was just wondering uh, uh, who they were speaking to. So were they speaking to each other? Were they speaking to the teacher or both? Or how, how was that uh, actually uh, played again? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, and um, um, they were speaking. Uh, I um, I was there as a researcher and um, facilitating the the conversation, but not more than just uh, being there and uh, in the context, like in the room. Um, and they were speaking um, uh, to each other. So there were so groups of three, and they had like an open ended conversation uh, together with the. The picture as the focus, so to speak. Yes, one could say that you did not, you did prompt the discussions, but with with your presence, with the with the, the organization of who is showing the picture and so on. But you did not intervene in the discussions. No, I gave them. I, I told them at the start they were they were told uh, they were asked to bring um, pictures and, and that's an important part as well it was um uh, they, they were they were very they got the opportunity they were asked do you want to partake in the study and there, there was certain groups uh, that wanted to partake so in advance they got this idea that they, they knew that they were going to bring a picture um, and that they would show it as a part of the conversation so that that was uh, an initial um, and then I started with telling them that this is the way we were going to do it we're going to have a look at one picture at a time and the person who brings the picture will not speak at first so that was the uh, that was the prompt that was uh, what I told them in advance and then uh, more than that I uh, took a step back so to speak
compare maybe how we do it individually, right? And the truth where it they communicate. We cannot hear the question. I'll, I'll try to summarize uh, Alex's comment here is that, uh, so if I understand it correctly, then uh, so the question is how, uh, how uh, speech itself facilitates uh, this conversation about uh, the pictures and uh, understanding of pictures. I understand that uh, whether doing it in, in group uh, adds something that uh, that uh, doing it alone might not uh, uh, give it. Yeah. Yes, the, the idea is that the, the group should, should, should be, it's the classroom didactic. So the group is, uh, is uh, uh, adding up to more, uh, to more dynamics or more discussions. Uh, and, um, and that, uh, um, but it was still uh, student-driven discussions, not teachers-driven discussions. The teacher managed the, the scene, <laughs> but uh, it was student-driven. But, but uh, me, myself, I, I understand that the reason why this kind of particular age group was picked is that in principle that they would understand everything that that yes. could be at least. Yes, they are at the, at the, at least when they are 14, at least according to Pierre it's the abstract thinking is there. So they have the full, uh, the full uh, capacity, but still they are uh, newcomers, <laughs> so to speak, in discussing abstract uh, themes and abstract uh, um, um, reflections, um, but the capacity and that they, they could do it, uh, but, but they are newcomers. And so, yeah. And Another. it could be as for adults, it could be that you are used to do it on different levels, but together you can find the, the ways. Any more very short questions from Zoom participants or? Yeah, but that's one more. Can you hear, pa Paulus? Can you hear me? Hello, Kara. Right. A, a, a small bit. We can hear you a small bit, I think. Small bit. Okay, sorry. Now is it, is it better now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. It's, it's very interesting. I'm always a bit fascinated by ethnographic studies uh, coming from a textual sort of background myself. I just had a couple of remarks. I'm not sure. Uh, perhaps you'll find them useful. Uh, on uh, the category of ab abstract uh, in, co in the concrete, uh, I, uh, this reminded me of Kresa uh, von Leuven, uh, mm -hmm. reading images, where we have this uh, interesting discussion on uh, conceptual images. Uh, uh, I think it's relevant to perhaps to, to this category. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing I was just uh, wondering on the, how you treat the plastic dimension. Uh, did I understand correctly that you see it as a sort of discussion of uh, abstract sort of qualities? Yes, it's when the, when the students talk about the blue <laughs> or the um, you can you can uh, you have more examples of it in your in your data on that. But so I, I'm not sure if I got it right, but if Anyway, the, what, I, what I was thinking about that uh, in uh, Beauploche and uh, Groupe Mu, uh, the plastic is still treated as uh, an expression and a content. So I was wondering uh, uh, if the children uh, yeah. attempt to ascribe contents to the plastic. Yes, so, at least. And at uh, least. If, uh, if that shows perhaps how. I don't know how uh, artificial that is, or 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 it's not. I don't know. It's just uh, I was just interested in that. Thanks. Yes, but just let me be clear, because for Group Me, uh, they are at least they are investigating whether the plastic level could be, <laughs> um, um, in a sense, have what kind of meaning could the plastic level have? So they do uh, problematize uh, the plastic level in that sense that that it could be a sign, but they the the the, the content sign or the content side of the plastic level is not that that's that's what they are investigating what it could be in a sense so it's uh, otherwise it becomes iconic if it's you know it's uh, um, 
um, meaningful in the same way as the figurative level in the in the division between the iconic or the pictorial and the plastic level. But uh, Annette, you have also not. You mean, you mean, for instance, if they said, "Oh, blue means this," or the way. The way they were, the, the way that I would, they're using the plastic was speaking of like the blurriness of a picture or the, um, how can this part be so, uh, like the, the texture of the paper. There was so, unfortunately, or maybe for, like, I suppose it doesn't matter, but there, there was one, the one drawing that was brought to the table um, on a piece of paper. So then they were speaking of the grain of the paper or like, is this thick paper? What kind of paper is this? Um, and the and the, the darkness of the sh the shading and stuff like that, and that was uh, probably specifically uh, was more, most prominent in the, the the drawing, the physical drawing that was brought, and also two other p um, uh, photographs that were uh, more uh, abstract in a sense, uh, the, a close up of a flower, like a very uh, close up of a flower and. Um, and some of the pictures. So, so they were more focusing on that when there wasn't any, in, in inverted commas, clear motifs as such. Um, and in the close up of the flower, they also made the manipulation on the plastic level. <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. It's yes. uh, probably this one here, um, where they were making it more fussy. Uh, and more, or more blurry and and working. Then they were speaking of the light. They were speaking of of the the whiteness coming in and the contrast between the white and the and the the cerise or pink uh, and the darkness here. So this type of images, which there wasn't many of, um, were, were there was a more more of a focus of the um, the plastic uh, dimension. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, uh, we have mm -hmm. to come to a stop here. Yes. Uh, so thanks once. Mm -hmm. Thank once you very much. Presentation and it was and thank you for your questions. So, uh, so um, I if you stop sharing the the screen, uh, very well. So. Uh, At this point, I would like to give a word to Alex. So, uh, your presentation is uh, open here. Yeah. No, it's not stored. Uh, so uh, next one uh, up is uh, Alex Barev uh, from the University of Tartu, Department of Semiotics. Uh, so he researches the semiotic aspects of learning processes and the development of sign operation in the context of digital culture in Lev Vygotsky's framework. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so yeah, when I found out myself like the loss in today's in today's uh, presentations, I decided to kind of cut uh, as much theory as possible. So I, I will try to be uh, kind of brief, brief and practical. So I hope it will kind of help help us uh, today evening. Um, so, yeah, and so I will uh, speak today about the first step uh, in one of my experimental uh, research, which I'm doing right now with my colleagues from uh, semiotics department in Ernst & and also from the psychology department. So this is a kind of a collaboration, collaboration research, and it's both, it's both theoretical and also in a big extent, it's a practical empirical uh, experimental study. Uh, and what we are doing there is we are trying to uh, investigate the role of inner speech and the meaning making process through artistic texts and both in the understanding of artistic texts and also in, in creating of them. So to start to start with, I would like to I would like you to look at one picture. 
for a couple of seconds and just think what this picture means to you. So it's quite silent right now in the audience, but probably it's not that silent in your heads. So probably there is some kind of a conversation going on there when you're looking at this picture, uh, maybe asking something, so there could be some kind of dialect, maybe some, some monologue is happening there. And this process uh, we normally call inner speech or, or verbal thinking. Um, and um, this is what we are going to talk about today uh, and specifically about its role in, in actually in perceiving um, uh, artworks. So uh, specifically the, the idea of the research came from the understanding of how uh, artistic texts actually are um, um, today kind of uh, significant in, in the carrying of meanings and knowledge and so on and so on. So if you look at the studies of press, of, of Livingstone, of Thorup, of uh, Jenkins, uh, Scalar, and so on and so on, they all argue for, uh, for this increasing role of, of new media in mediating information, mediating knowledge, meanings, and so on and so on. And most part of this, of this new media is, of course, are of course uh, digital artistic texts and what is also important is that artistic texts are very often uh, so to say non-linguistic so that they carry information and uh, not via words and uh, not in these kind of linguistic forms but rather in different uh either visual or uh, auditory or other forms of, of um, artistic uh, artistic forms um yeah so th there was also another another reason for the research i will speak about it a little bit later uh, but just uh, to quickly fresh up on, on, on the process of inner speech, I think that in this regard, uh, what I'm talking about is very well kind of continues what uh, Laurie also was talking about and also what, what we heard before. But if you're talking about the inner speech, then, then uh, it's a classical understanding was first uh, presented by Lev Pogotsky, uh, and he understood it as a special, uh, specific formation, a special speech activity with its own laws and complex relations to the other forms of speech activity. And um, um, although our understanding of inner speech has significantly grown from that time, we already did not understand it of, of only this kind of uh, link between, between uh, thinking and speech, but uh, rather uh, even a bigger process. Um, though Vygotsky's understanding is pretty, pretty actual, it remains very actual today, so it doesn't provide too much of limitations to our understanding of inner speech. Uh, however, he also brought the, the one of the contemporary papers uh, written by the uh, Alison Day uh, Ferninghal, uh, who actually uh, also very well described inner speech. So it's not maybe the very precise understanding, but I would say it's pretty laconic in a way. So they understand inner speech as the subjective experience of language in the absence of overt or audible articulation. Uh, and again, here we're not talking only about, about this, this kind of um, uh, sub vocal rehearsal, but uh, inner speech is a very, very diverse process uh, which is related to different, different cognitive and psychological functions. Again, Laurie is also talking about today uh, a lot about this, the role of speech in general. Um, yeah, for instance, uh, inner speech is very much involved in, in for instance, working memory. Yeah. Um, so um, another important account, or uh, also. Yeah, we should also um, mention here that that uh, Vygotsky was also one of the first to not just uh, scientifically um, uh, present in the speech, uh, but also uh, describe it in, in um, uh, or gave it kind of a semiotic account because um, uh, inner speech was one of the most kind of central elements in, in his big uh, study in his cultural historical theory, which was actually explaining this this uh, formation of higher psychological functions with the dominant dominant role of science. Uh, and again, I will not go very deeply here uh, here in theory. I think um, uh, if we have time, we can we can discuss it more precisely. Um, another important um, semiotic account was added uh, by uh, Nikolai Jenkin, who was um, uh, a neurolinguist. And what Nikola Jenkin did actually, as he was also trying to kind of find the links between, between uh, cognitive process, more specifically thinking uh, and speech. And he was very much interested in, in, in studying inner speech. And what he did is actually he conducted a series of, of experimental research. Uh, but again, we're not going to go very deeply. What I would uh, really like to emphasize here is his, the hypothesis that he's, um, he, he has done. 
And the hypothesis was, um, it was on the, of course, based on, on his observations of the participants which were, which were uh, doing different activities there. But uh, his hypothesis was basically that, that inner speech uh, is not released only in this um, uh, motor vocal uh, code, but it's also released in, so to say, object pictorial code. Uh, in other words, uh, inner speech does not operate only with, with um, so to say, this, this uh, linguistic dimension, but it also operates with uh, the pictorial representations of reality, which are also uh, internalized together with the language, again, as, as Vygotsky, for example, was, was describing. Uh, in other words, our inner speech uh, is a, a kind of a combination of both the internalized speech and internalized uh, pictorial representations of reality, which are referred to specific, specific real objects. And this, this is a very important, uh, very important claim that, that Chinkin did because this, this um, uh, refers to the uh, multimodal dimension of inner speech, which at a later point, very recently actually, was, uh, um, was already uh, partly, partly proved by some neuroscientific research. It's still, there's still not that, that much of research, but it starts to appear and it starts to prove this, this um, Jenkins idea about the mixed code of inner speech. What is also important here is Jenkins um, Jenkin, um, hypothesized that this mixed code of inner speech is actually very important for, uh, as, as this kind of a link between our um, internal interiorized experience and also the outer text, outer text in both cases. So to say the linguistic text or, or maybe even speech, and also uh, artistic ones. So this creates kind of a link, which helps us to, uh, on the one hand, understand the outer world, again, outer world in different senses, uh, in the world of uh, natural uh, language and in artistic text. And also it, it is this kind of uh, intermediate link in creating an utterance, again, in both of these uh, dimensions. Uh, and actually, this already kind of uh, gives us the idea that inner speech can be manifested in outer world, so we kind of can bring our inner speech in, so to say, kind of a measurable, measurable form. Um, yeah, but um, uh, this was very well uh, already described by uh, Vygotsky when he was talking about um, uh, children pictures. Um, so what we are doing actually, uh, like our first steps in putting our inner speech into, so to say, artistic manner and artistic form uh, happens very early when children start to make their first drawings, or maybe even not, not, not first, but still um, uh, make different drawings. Um, so what you can see here is you can see the different pictures made by a little child. So um, actually, I wonder what you can see in this picture. So what, what is, what is um, depicted here? Any yeah. ideas? <laughs> well, well, yeah, the answer is pretty simple, basically. You know, uh, her parents, herself, mostly father, mother, and her. Uh, and on the one hand, these pictures may seem a little bit kind of funny. Uh, they don't have this very well uh, done uh, proportions and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, what Vygotsky also proposed is that, is that um, what, what the children use the, the, the drawings for is not actually to use them as artistic text as such, but rather it's a very interesting form of communication. So in the way how they communicate their inner world, they, it's the first step in communicating their, as we can already say, kind of inner speech. Uh, because if we look at the pictures, we can very easily say where the mother is. So it's usually the biggest uh, uh, person, so to say, in the pictures. You also can see the emotions. So in every picture here, the child is trying to communicate the most important elements of, of his environment, of his inner life, uh, and um, and so on and so on. Yeah. So um, but why these pictures are interesting for us is because this is kind of the first attempt. Uh, how we try to put inner speech into artistic text, how we try to manifest them in uh, terms of artistic, artistic, um, um, well, we can say, yeah, artistic text. Uh, but of course, later we try to do it in a more and more sophisticated way. So we try to, to put our inner speech into, for example, our diaries, and already maybe in artistic uh, languages, creating more sophisticated texts. 
uh, and uh, as Lotman referred to artistic language uh, as as um, um, secondary modeling system, uh, it's important here uh, for two reasons. The first one is because this uh, this artistic languages which we're using to manifest our inner speech are based on on the natural language as secondary modeling systems are. But on the other hand, uh, this secondary modeling system they also have this additional dimension, something which is not uh, be which cannot be conveyed via uh, linguistic forms, something that is added in the artistic text. And this is, I think, something which is really, really um, um, kind of similar to what, to what inner speech provides in comparison with social speech. So again, there is some kind of dimension which is not, which is not communicable, communicable in, in forms of um, social speech. And this is what we saw in, 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 Jenkins, in Jenkins' model. So um, interestingly enough, inner speech on the one hand can be uh, manifested in artistic texts, but on the other hand, inner speech is also sometimes used as a model for artistic texts or a model for artistic languages. Uh, and a good example there is this, the uh, study done by Eisenstein who um, used the model of inner speech to create the most sophisticated forms of montage in cinematic, cinematic language. And this is a pretty interesting phenomenon because what, what Eisenstein did is he actually researched inner speech uh, to try to, to, to kind of uh, reflect its processes, its phenomenology in the form of, of uh, cinematic language to create these forms of montage, which on the one hand had to be very kind of symbolic uh, and uh, kind of speak a lot with very few words, which also inner speech does. And on the one hand, on the other hand, sorry, it has to be very, very understandable. So it has to uh, very uh, perfectly reflect uh, reflects our cognitive processes. So this is what what um, uh, Eisenstein did. But also, it's interesting that that of course um, this forms already has significantly significantly uh, grown and significantly um, got complicated in uh, forms of of uh, contemporary. Uh, culture, uh, which uh, Manovich already called the anti-montage. So today we can already see the phenomenon of anti-montage, which uh, is uh, much more different from what Eisenstein did. And by anti-montage, uh, Manovich refers to, to this uh, different elements of audiovisual narrations, uh, which are not just opposed, but blended, and they are boundary rates rather than foreground. So for him, it's already this kind of a special phenomenon rather than just very, very kind of um, a specific specific and, and um, um, yeah, um, uh, related to, to the artistic language. So, um, yeah, so what we are trying to do in our study is that we, we decided that we have to actually uh, look at what, uh, how does actually this meaning making happen when we uh, perceive these different artistic works. And we decided to basically to look at the inner speech. The reason we decided to look at it is I think already pretty clear um, so the reason is that uh, inner speech is this, this uh, great blend between the cognitive process, between semiotic process, and the process of using, uh, of using language together. Uh, and we decided to look at, at um, how actually, to what is basically the role of our inner speech is in understanding artistic work. So and we have put to, uh, here three uh, important aims for us. Uh, the first one would be uh, the, actually the development of the methodology of researching, of researching inner speech, uh, as inner speech is, is, um, is it's historically very difficult to study uh, because it doesn't have any kind of uh, physical, physical form. So it's very difficult to analyze even using the contemporary methodologies, although uh, today, the contemporary uh, forms of studying, such as uh, EEG or M fMRI, for example, they really help in that. And because of that, the studies of inner speech uh, today are more and more popular, especially in psychology and psychiatry. So we thought that this is a really great time when semiotics can really step up here and also propose its own, uh, its own work for the development of inner speech research, and mostly because as you can see, semiotics has a very, very long history of, of uh, inner, speech, inner speech research. Uh, and the second thing we are trying to do actually is to see uh, the, gen the general 
uh, role of uh, inner speech in the meaning making of artistic texts and both in understanding artistic texts and the creation of them. And uh, thirdly, we would like to, uh, to see the phenomenology of inner speech in this regard. So how this use of inner speech is actually different from other uses of inner speech. When we use it in different contexts, in different kind of, kind of situations and for different reasons, basically. Um, so we developed the two, two stages of the, of the study. Uh, so in the first stage, we uh, decided to use uh, the mixed audience with people of different age, different culture, background, and different kind of level of, of engagement into art. So some, some of them could be even artists. Uh, and then we uh, will try to show them different artistic texts and also uh, ask them to make a simple artistic text. If you're interested about it, I can, I can talk about it a bit later. Uh, of how we do it and um, yeah and so uh, we would like to also organize the interviews in which we will um, uh, analyze the self-reflection of the of the participants on the inner speech process which they experience uh, during either either looking at these different works of art something which we're, we're doing at the beginning of it uh, beginning of this of this um, lecture and also while creating this different works of art and in the second stage uh, we will use uh, the result that we received from the interviews uh, to already make a more specific more concrete kind of study so we will already have the study done in groups according to the different audiences uh, and we uh, of course yeah this this stage will remain the same uh, but we already will use the mixed methodology uh, so we will use the questionnaire, which will be based again on this previous, uh, previous stage, uh, in which will be based on this previous uh, self-reflection done, done by the audience. We will also use the experience sampling, which means that the questions of the questionnaire can be asked not only after looking at the picture, but also sometimes during uh, the process of looking at the pictures at some specific kind of uh, time period. We'll also use the additional additional methodologies provided by our colleagues from the psychology department, such as uh, EEG and also video oculography, like eye scanners, for example, this eye tracking systems, to again see how the inner speech process reflects the way a person is looking at the picture, uh, and whether it again can can uh, tell us something about the role of inner speech in understanding artistic works. And the final step will be again in the interpretation. And here we will also focus on these two main questions. Uh, so the role of inner speech and the phenomenology. Um, yeah, I said we will use this mixed methodology, but our basic one will be, of course, of course, the questionnaire. They are very well used today in inner speech research. And we are, will not use the kind of questionnaire which we make up ourselves. Uh, but rather we will uh, use as the basis the questionnaire which uh, has already been very well used in inner speech studies. It's the varieties of inner speech questionnaire done by McCarthy and Jones and Fernihal. But this study was used very much in, uh, sorry, this methodology was, was used very much in um, psychiatry studies. So we decided to slightly change it slightly, uh, modify it so that it can fit, fit the aims of our study. Um, so, and I would like to quickly share um, with you some results because of our preliminary study. So again, I should point here that this is not um, any kind of final result. So we cannot make any kind of judgments based on it and any kind of outcomes of it. So it's a very, very first preliminary study, which we use to just check the procedure, check how the, the, the methodology works and so on and so on. So what we did here is we uh, did the study with 17 people, uh, 16 of which uh, were uh, women and one was men. Uh, the average age was 25 years old. And here we didn't do the interviews yet, but we were just looking at these different types of or, or different, um, 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 well, uh, these different uh, uh, forms of inner speech in a way. So either it was dialogic or monologic one, either it was condensed, so very shortened as we usually use it uh, for, for, um, uh, for daily basis, or maybe it was like this long and, and full sentences. We also were looking at this multimodal dimension of inner speech where they were related to some 
kind of um, additional associations, either pictorial or auditory, or some, some maybe, maybe even olfactory ones. And they were also uh, looking at what kind of words they were using in the same speech. What, what is real words, or were these words maybe something which um, doesn't even exist, something like that. And uh, the participants were answering the questionnaire twice, so we were trying to check whether, like, how, how consistent the answers were. And basically, the correlation was pretty okay, so it was like, uh, 0.75, but again, we had a very, very, very uh, small um, uh, sample of participants. So here are some, some results. Again, is this preliminary study, but anyway, what was interesting here is that um, um, the dialogic inner speech uh, was 7.5% more frequently experienced rather than the monologic ones. And also, it was interesting that one person uh, uh, heard the voices of the characters uh, in the head commenting and describing the picture. And considering that we had a very small sample of people there, it's, well, it's not that, that, that small number here as, as it looks. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, again, pretty interesting in, in the role of inner speech in this meaning making process. Uh, also, what was interesting that more than half of the, of the uh, respondents had a conversation with themselves. So they were actively asking and answering uh, questions to each other which is also interesting, especially in relation to uh, artistic text. Um, and more than half of the respondents used short phrases or single words instead of this full sentence, which was, uh, I think, very, very um, uh, okay. So we, we were expecting this. And also uh, seeing object associations was the most important. So this, this part is about the small common dimension of inner speech. Uh, so this means that this 34 percent, uh, 34 percent, uh, these visual associations with objects were more popular than the, the smells ones, and 10 percent more uh, common than the sounds. And we had also one uh, interesting additional observation that the 77, uh, sorry, 47 percent of respondents thought that their thoughts were in the form of comments and descriptions of which 41% uh, were sure that they had heard the comments with their own voice and not with the voice of someone else. But it's only again 41% of them, which again is pretty interesting in this regard. We also believe that, that this study will uh, have not only uh, the theoretical uh, value for both uh, disciplines for psychology and semiotics, but will also have uh, a lot of a practical value, uh, and we are considering these dif different uh, ways of how uh, we can release this result in a practical way. But I will not go very deeply in it, so I would just like to finish this, uh, this presentation with um, a very good citation from, from Jenkins work, um, which I think very much, very well, um, again, reflects this study. So Jenkins was saying that meaning begins to form before language and speech, it is necessary to see things, move among them, listen, touch, in the word, accumulate in memory all the sensory information that enters the analyzers. Only un under these conditions is speech received by the ear. From the very beginning, it is processed as a sign system and integrated in the act of semiotics. So thank you so much. Do we have questions from? from uh, here or from the participants on, on Zoom? I have a short question if it's, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, this is very interesting. Uh, and um, I want to know more about the study, but uh, when, you, when the participants were uh, you have this. You had interviews with the participants about the about the inner speech. Did I understand you correctly, or was it only the this um, form uh, with the prepared uh, with the stru structural questions, or was it some kind of qualitative um, um, description of their inner speech? Uh, yeah, so the idea will be that yes, first to, to conduct the interviews so that we ha we can better design this questionnaire, which will be used later. Because yeah. Now that it will be pretty dif difficult to to narrow this this uh, questionnaire to fit of this specific um, study aims. 
Yeah, so it's so it corresponds in a sense to their what they are looking at the picture, or because it was what they presented to a picture. So it was in in relation to a pictorial um, contemplation or, or something. Or uh, how how about how did you introduce the questions? You mean in the interview? Yeah, in oh. in this in the connection to 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 this uh, this relation between the artistic text and and how it uh, uh, intervenes with the uh, inner speech and how the individual perceives it herself as in inner speech about the picture. Mm, I think it's a very good question. Basically, uh, um, since we didn't do the interviews in the preliminary study. Uh, the preliminary study was the reason why we decided to do the interviews because we un we understood that the the, uh, the initial questionnaire which we proposed just doesn't always uh, work in the way we want so it doesn't always reflect this mm -hmm. inner speech process that participants had while looking at the pictures um, and uh, the idea of the questionnaire oh, sorry of this interview will be to um, to make it an, uh, as open as possible. So our idea is not to, to provide them with a strict um, list of questions, but rather to make it all, all more of an open self-reflection and see uh, how they respond, because this basic interview will not go to, well, will not be further analyzed in the results, but rather we will use these interview results to create the questionnaire. To create the questionnaire, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that, that's the basic. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? Yeah, of course. Uh, of course, uh, every piece of art has some some meaning in 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 its context. So, from art historical point of view, do you are showing modern contemporary art things, or some historical, or very ancient, or from some very ancient civilizations, we, which we are not sure can we understand at all such kind of pictures. Thank you for the question. It's also a very important question for our research team because we are right now in the process of, of figuring out how we're gonna choose these different artistic texts because the way we choose them will really influence right, the, the, the process. And of course, uh, the, contextual, uh, the contextual dimension is very, very much important. And so again, here, I think this is where actually semiotic can really work well in creating the methodology of this study because right now we are we are thinking that we will have different so to say um types or groups of these artistic texts so uh we will try to make the different uh, artistic texts differ in the way they uh reflect the reality so it's rather more kind of this abstract ones or less abstract ones uh, also, we are thinking about uh, choosing the different artistic works in, in which, um, in a way, are contextualized so that they are related to a particular, for example, they have a cultural dimension. Because the picture which I was showing you at the beginning, I'm sure for, for, for some people here, it was uh, speaking much more than for the others. Uh, especially if I, if, I, if I would give the context, because this, this picture was drawn by uh, one Estonian uh, artist who lives in Supilin and Tartu. So if, if I said that this at the beginning with, for some of you, it may say actually a bit more for some less. So this kind of contextual element here is very, very important. Another important thing, which we are also considering here is actually whether we are going to show the participants, the pictures in the real environment where they exist. For example, uh, we are considering to show the, the, the picture of some contemporary art, which is painted on the walls in the city and so we, we maybe we need to show the kind of the general environment around uh, to, so to say, um, to keep this, <laughs> this inner speech processes going and, and to keep this many making process going. So yeah, so right now it's, it's, it's a very big question for us how to choose it, but we are definitely considering all, all this uh, um, contextual dimensions and, and historical dimensions, of course, yeah. Yeah. Can I do so have time? Um, firstly, thank you. It was incredibly uh, interested. I didn't understand everything, but um, I was just very curious to know if any research was done in terms of bilingual or multilingual people, in terms of um, what you call it, phonology and dialogic um, in the speech. And, mm -hmm. you know, how 
Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, uh, there uh, have been some research, uh, actually not, not many, very many studies were done, but they were done some. Uh, I cannot say about the differences in how they use it in a monologic or dialogic way. I'm not sure if there have been such specific studies, but what, they, uh, what the researchers were investigating there is mostly how bilingual children, for example, bilingual people in general use inner speech uh, for thinking, for some uh, uh, I don't know, uh, problem solving, for instance. And what's pretty interesting is that in many cases, they use uh, different languages for different purposes. Uh, and right now, uh, the studies kind of, they, 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 um, they have this kind of ongoing argument of, of what the reasons of choosing these different languages are. So uh, the study I was, I was um, uh, reading recently was that they were, they were emphasizing the idea why a person is choosing one language for one situation, one, another language for another situation actually belongs to just to the way how we get used to you. For example, if, if you are always speak if you're bilingual, if you, if you use, for example, English uh, in the math mathematics classroom, then you will count in, 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 uh, in English mostly. And for example, if you, I don't know, uh, uh, yeah. This is, this is what, uh, right? going to be interesting because if you learn about subjects in one language, you learn about the Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And uh, this, this is the question which is also very difficult to answer. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah I'm, all, I'm also very curious. Uh, the problem right now, I think, is that uh, inner speech is such a complex thing that uh, we as adults have a lot of difficulties in, in analyzing it, right? So it's pretty difficult to just sit and reflect on what, kind, what sort of inner speech I'm using and, and what, what are these things that, that, that are happening in my head when I speak to myself. And for the child, for example, to us, it's even more difficult. Um, and it's the third difficulty is that you cannot see it, for example, in EEG. So what you can see there is actually if there is some conversation going on. Yes. But what kind of conversation? <laughs> That's really hard to answer. So th this, is why, uh, this is why I think, again, semiotics is important here is because we need right now this kind of um, synchrony be between different disciplines who contribute to inner speech research to, to create this kind of a more holistic image of, of inner speech studies. Yeah, so I think... Yeah, that's, that's what I really want to do is to, to bring different disciplines to make this uh, synchrony, to make this, um, yeah. So we are very late. Yeah, I know sorry. To give Anastasia a chance as well still, if the question is very brief. Uh -huh. Yes, my, yeah. I I can uh, well can I hear yes because my yeah. question in chat wasn't that specified I would just uh, turn it a little bit around so thanks for your presentation my question is as every person uh, has his mother tongue so uh, there is like first main language also for bilingual as well there is one there is a little bit more major than the other one. How was uh, this uh, inner speech test? Was it translated or not? Because. Uh... Sorry, we lost you. So, so the question was yeah, that was the inner I, I, speech, I, I, speech I think we should be adjust to this mother tongue. Uh, Anastasia, sorry, we, we lost you, but I heard your question. I, I, I will try to respond. Uh, so in, in our preliminary study that we did, uh, the study was conducted only in one language. It was only for uh, Estonian speaking uh, students. Uh, so there we didn't have this, this uh, language specific dimension, but when we will do a bigger study, we will of course uh, do it in different languages considering the, the mother tongue, of course. And I don't know, maybe, maybe we should consider the bilingual people as well. And, this will be a real, real challenge on how to actually to, to analyze it. Yeah. Um, I think I was wondering uh, about the semiotic side of the, the research. I understand that you think it was semiotic, yeah. from Larry's presentation as well. 
myself, but I remember more about Lothman. And uh, I'm pretty sure that when Lothman speaks about art, it does not mean drawing by, by children. Uh, I mean, uh, it's about culture in the secondary sense. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, in a just very loose, speculative manner, do you, do you think uh, or have you ever thought of uh, in your speech having some cultural sort of form? Maybe uh, the cultural development that would be based on in your speech or related to in your speech in some sense? Is this a lot funny in a sense? Like, uh, as there is language and there is then a secondary sort of articulation, mm -hmm. which is culture for Lotman. Is there a, a same thing for inner language? Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or should there be or could there be is this uh, a thing that you think about it or, or not? I suppose that, that here uh, we can again refer a little bit to Vygotsky because uh, again, Lotman was very familiar with Vygotsky's work, by the way. Uh, and Vygotsky was also saying such an interesting thing that basically, I think it reflects to what Laurie was speaking about this, this uh, uh, auxiliary link that, that we have. Uh, the idea is that uh, every culture creates its own, um, its own um, uh, artifacts that we use to, to mediate our cognitive processes, uh, to mediate our, our psychological process. And so, so is the inner speech is one of our cognitive processes. So in a way, uh, I again I haven't uh, 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 dig very very deeply into this question which, which you're uh, asking, but I suppose that the question should be there. Uh, sorry, the answer should be there in, in what Vygotsky says about these different artifacts that each culture proposes. So probably it, there is this cultural dimension which is related to inner speech, but. Um, uh, so far, it's it, it would it, it it hasn't been very I think very broadly studied in, in, in semiotics at least. I think. Take it very literally. Do you think the stream of consciousness in literature could be inner speech? Oh, uh, meaning meaning that thing? Of course, of it's course. Yes. Uh, if if you're speaking about this thing, then uh, I I would refer to Peter Thorup, uh, who recently also um, he published a paper where he uncovered very very many. Uh, diaries and drafts done by by uh, Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because these drafts are so so condensed that these so much reflect of this uh, this kind of inner speech or maybe even private speech of, of Dostoevsky when he was uh, creating his um, Anna Karenina, uh, sorry uh, his um, uh, crime and punishment uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, we we definitely we were all good and a uh, little extra, but uh, thanks for lasting with us. And, uh, and it's time to, time to conclude it. Okay. Thanks.